blessed us, dear Lord. And Father God, we just want to give back to you because you have blessed us. And God, we're believing, dear Lord, as we give in this offering, God, that you're going to bless it, that you're going to multiply it for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your honor. I pray you bless all those that give today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you today as you give in this offering. Amen. Amen. As many of you know, Pastor, we had Pastor Appreciation last week. Thank you for all those that participated and helped out with that. Uh, those that uh, blessed Pastor and Sister Glory, and they are out on sabbatical right now for uh, the week and getting some due rest. How many know after 40 years, they, they deserve some rest? They deserve some refreshing. And we are so honored and so blessed that Sister Joyce is going to be coming at this time to minister in the Word to us today. Let's give her and the Lord a hand as she comes to minister in the Word today. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> now I hear. <laughs> um, before we get started this morning, I, I, I do want to let you know, Pastor, I want to make sure you know that he and Sister Gloria will be back in time for our new service this Thursday night. And um, this service, we, we are, um, our church is in a time of reset and you hear people say, I wish things would go back to normal. God has placed us in a new normal. And normal isn't coming back, but Jesus is. Amen. Jesus is coming back. And uh, Pastor has shared a little bit about this, but on Thursday night, it's, it's really more practical. Um, because we're going to be following the New Testament model for the way the body of Christ came together. It's, even though we believe it's going to grow, it's going to have a feeling of, of small group intimacy. We know that in, in the New Testament it talks about how they, they went from house to house breaking bread and having fellowship. And, and this service is going to be, you know, when I, I believe it's in Timothy, it talks about one will have a song, one will have have a word, and, and we're just going to allow God to move in this service on Thursday night, and it's also an alternative. Sometimes families uh, travel on the weekend, maybe to go visit other families. You're on vacation, but you still want to get into a good service. Thursday night also counts as a worship service. If you're here Thursday night, we count you as though you were here Sunday. And it's not about numbers, but the impact of that service is going to be weighty. And we want you to be part of that. And there's also um, most, most uh, every Thursday, I think, there's going to be an agape meal at 6 o'clock before we gather here in the sanctuary. And we're going to have fellowship and, and break that bread together. And also, Pastor, wanted to let you know that he will be doing altar ministry at these Thursday night services. There will be word. There will be worship. There will be testimony. But it's going to have the feeling of a body coming together like a family. And worshiping the Lord. Also, he'd like me to let you know, Easter Sunday, we are celebrating our new normal. We're going to celebrate our new normal. Kind of tongue-in-cheek, he said, we might even burn a mask or two. <laughs> we are celebrating the new normal. We're calling, calling the family back in. How many of you know that people scattered? during COVID. We are declaring that they are coming back in and we want the family to come back in on Easter Sunday morning and let's move forward and get out of this mindset of crisis that our nation has been in and the world has been in and let's remember who we are and who we serve and allow, allow ourselves to celebrate that normal isn't coming back. It's a new normal and Jesus is coming back. Amen. And then also, um, you know that Pastor's Heart has been for our church to more and more progress in Davidic worship. 
The long-term goal is 24-7 worship in this house. And so we are going to begin. We're going to take steps. And on Sunday evening, April 3rd at 6 o'clock, we'll be right here in the sanctuary. And there will be worship and testimony and worship and testimony. We're just going to minister to the Lord. We're just going to come together and thank him and honor him and be in his presence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all, pardon me. That was a lot. My mouth got dry. (laughs) (laughs) This morning, I want you to know that the Lord began to build this word in my spirit about a year ago. He's given it to me in pieces and parts but he never would release me to give it. And he has now released it. And it is a word that the body of Christ needs to hear. It's a word that, that believers need to hear, especially from what we have come out of. We know that the Bible, Jesus said that there would be a great falling away before he comes. And some people think that COVID cause that falling away. Well, I don't know about that because we're calling them back in. But there will be a falling away. And the message I have to share with you this morning, I believe the Lord is going to give us some keys that we can understand what we must do that we not be part of that falling away. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. As we are about to minister your word, I thank you that you hide me. I am hidden in you. I thank you that ears and hearts and minds have already been prepared. Thank you for your presence that's in this house. It's been a setup this morning. Now we thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text this morning is found in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, I must tell you, um, I love the Amplified. Not everything's going to be out of the Amplified Bible, but I tend to read, read out of it. This is what it says in the New King James. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. I came this morning to blow the cover of the enemy of being offended at God. Most of us sitting in this room would say, oh, I'm not offended at the Lord. I trust him. I love him. He's been so good to me. And I'm sure that's probably true in most cases. But may I tell you that there are people who have been disappointed. We were singing, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let me down. And that's true. Jesus won't let you down, but our heart must be aligned with his to understand what the good things are that he wants to do in our life. The offense comes when God doesn't do it the way we think he should do it. And people become, can even become bitter because God didn't come through the way they wanted him to. When John was in that prison, Herod had him in that prison. He's in there rotting in that place full of sewage and stench and and just horrible conditions. Now here is the man that came and preached the message and was preparing the way of the Lord. Jesus said of him in in, uh, chapter 11, verse 11, he said, I tell you among those born of women, there there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. 
He said, and yet the least in the kingdom is greater than he. So John, he's hearing reports of what's happening as Jesus is going out and ministering. And he sends two of his disciples. Go ask him, are you the one? Or should we wait for another? And when I read that, my mind begins to ask questions. Why would John ask that? I mean, this is John the Baptist. The dude was tough. He wore camel's hair and he ate bugs. And he lived out in the wilderness. And I'll guarantee you it was no Holiday Inn Express. And he boldly pointed out and called out sin. He didn't care who you were. And he was pointing people to Jesus. He did, they didn't know he was, but then when Jesus showed up, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I'm wondering, okay, John, you send these guys and say, are you the one? That tells me that John in that prison, he's closed in there in those conditions and the enemy, I believe, began to battle his mind and battle his thoughts. What if you had it wrong, John? What if you missed it? What if all that was for nothing and Jesus is not the one? What if? What if? What if? And then I wonder if he sat there and like the disciples, you know, they, they, they thought that Jesus was going to be king, an earthly king, right then where they were. He thought, they thought that, that, that God was going to raise Jesus up to be king and change the dynamic of everything that was happening in their world under Roman rule. Could it be that John in that prison with all those questions, he's thinking, well, if Jesus is going to be the new king, why am I still languishing in this prison? Why was Herod allowed to put me here because I called out that he was with his brother's wife? He called out sin. He was doing what God had given him to do. And yet here he sat. And in those questions and in those circumstances, he says, are you the one? Or am I waiting on somebody else? I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when the circumstances that I found myself in, the enemy would come and just begin to whisper. Yeah. What if serving God has been for nothing? What if sacrifices that you and your husband and your family have made what if it means nothing look at the look at this situation look where you are look at the loss you buried two children who does that if God really loves them this is not a poor me I'm just using that as an example life happens and the enemy will attack us and try to cause us he'll try to trip us up and cause us to be offended at God as though God has done some wicked thing that is contrary to his character God is love we would never say I'm offended with you God but in our heart is there a place that we've held? A place that has been tender by wounding? Where the circumstances of life have broken us and we have not surrendered those things to God? I have heard people who did not get the specific answer to prayer that they were trusting God for. And God did not do it the way they wanted him to do it. I've heard people say, do I sound bitter? Well, I am, but I'll get over it. That root of bitterness, that root of bitterness, the word of God says that we should be careful and not let any root of bitterness be in our hearts, that it not spring up because a root will grow and it will produce bitter fruit. He said, and if it springs up, it will trouble you and it will defile many Bitterness can spread. It's like a cancer. 
So how do we keep from being bitter? We get real honest with God. You know what? I believe it's okay to tell him, God, I don't understand this, and I'm upset, and I need you to talk to me and explain this to me. I don't get it, Lord. His shoulders are big enough for us to say those things to him. His shoulders were big enough. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wasn't that Jesus didn't believe God. He was there before the foundation of the world. When the plan of salvation was all laid out, he knew how the story was going to end. But in his humanity, I believe he cried out, have you forsaken me? Why, why, why? Why did I lose my job? Why did my marriage fall apart? I did everything I knew to do, God. You didn't change her. You didn't change him. Listen, God did not create us to be robots. He gave every man and woman a free will. And there are things in this life that the actions of others and the choices of others mean that things may not go the way we want them to go. But it does not change the faithfulness of God to carry us and to be with us. And that his word says, I know the plans I have for you to do you good and not to harm you, to give you hope and an expected end. That's still who he is. What is offense? The um, particular Greek word in in Almost every one of these scriptures we're going to talk about is scandalizo. Scandalizo. That's where we get our word scandalize. It's to entrap, trip up, or entice to sin. It is that which hinders right conduct, to cause to stumble, to be offended or be enticed to apostasy. Apostasy, what is that? A willful, deliberate rebellion and departure from the faith. Willful rejection of a once held faith in Christ, renouncing it and seeks to undermine the gospel. It is someone choosing to purposefully be an enemy of Christ. But that's what scandalizo means. And that was the word when Jesus said, Blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. I believe Jesus said, you go tell John what you've seen. You give him all these examples. But before he sent him away, he said, Blessed is he who's not offended. I believe he was saying, when you go, you tell him, don't be offended, John. Don't be offended because God is with you. God is with you. In 1 Chronicles chapter 13, we know that in this chapter is where David decided to bring together all the people of Israel. And he said to them, he said, what do you all think? I think it's time we take the ark of God back to Jerusalem. And it said that the people, people said it's what, it's what seemed good to them. And I'm trying to paraphrase because I need to move. Go to the next one. The people thought it was a good thing. All the assembly agreed to do so for they thought it was right. And the, the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now drop down. Next scripture. Nope. Okay, never mind. I'm going to go to it and read it. Right here. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio, his brother, drove the cart. Verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 8. And David and all Israel merrily celebrated before God. With all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets... They were having a party. They were having a full-on blowout worship celebration. The ark of God is coming back to Jerusalem, and it is a big deal, and we are all celebrating, and oh, my God must love our worship. He must be so impressed.
And when they came to the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. For the oxen that were drawing the cart stumbled and were restive. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him. King James says he had a breach against Uzzah. That word means that God literally, it was a bursting forth on Uzzah because he raised his hand to steady the ark. And Uzzah died just like that. And the word of God goes on to say, verse 11, And David was offended because the Lord had broken forth upon Uzzah. That place to this day is called Perez Uzzah, the breaking forth upon Uzzah. And David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not bring the ark home to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Let's talk a little bit about David. It says, first, he was angry. And second, now King James says he was displeased, but the Hebrew word said he was angry. He was hot, literally to be hot, to boil, to have great, feel a sense of wroth and anger, just, just, just an outburst of anger. When he saw that, he was angry. He was offended at God. But then it said he feared God. And that fear had to do with being afraid of the awesomeness of who this God was and is. That just like that, because Uzzah touched that ark. You see, if you read, if, if you go back in the book of Numbers, you find that, that there was a certain way that that ark was to be transported. And, and before, the, before uh, I think it was the Korathites, before those gentlemen could move that ark, they had to put badger skins and cover it over. And it says clearly, and if anyone touches the holy things, they will die. Amen. Amen. And Uzzah was trying to steady a holy thing and operating outside the authority that he had been given by God. And when he touched the holy thing, God took him just like that. He burst forth on him. And when David feared, it also, it also means that he had seen a terrible thing. All of a sudden he realized... This is horrible. This is horrible. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God back to Jerusalem? I think in that moment, I believe that was a wake-up call. I believe that David, instead of worrying about what seemed good to the people, I believe that in that time, I believe David wanted to make sure he did it according to the word that had been given them and the instruction that had been given them. David was fearful of the awesome God, and he realized that it had been an offense to God for Uzzah to touch the ark of his presence. It didn't go the way David planned. David thought this great celebration, we're going to get the ark back in Jerusalem. This is wonderful. It's been gone. We're bringing it home. But it didn't go like he thought it was going to go. Listen, folks, we can make plans in our lives and we can say, okay, it's going to be this X, Y, and Z, and God's going to do this and everything. Listen, I know we act in faith. We walk in faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. But when we in our flesh begin to ask for things and expect things, oh, there's an entitlement mentality out there somewhere. And when those things that we think would be good, as the people seem to think it would be good, and we think they would be good, but we have not really brought God into the equation and said, God, what do you say? And when it doesn't work out, then we're frustrated and we're offended and we're saying, but God, why? May I tell you that I believe offense is the open door and will be the open door for the great falling away. Because Jesus says some hard things in his word. 
Listen, I'm all about the grace and mercy of God. I wouldn't be here today and neither would you if it weren't for the grace and mercy of God. I'm not all put together. I don't have the pieces together. Some days I think I don't have all my marbles in one bag. I know where they are. They're just not in the bag. But we were singing this morning about surrender and how my heart is yours. The word of God says, you are not your own. You are bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. David was offended and then he was fearful. So he didn't bring the presence of God back to Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 4, and I'm, I'm not going to go back and read all that, but you can. It's Mark chapter uh, 4 where Jesus tells the parable of the sower and the seed. And the Bible says that some seed fell on stony ground, and it said there wasn't much earth. So it sprang up quickly. But when the heat of the day came, then it wilted. It died. And the disciples wanted an explanation. I'll tell you what, these guys, Jesus must have got frustrated sometimes. He must have. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Listen, he probably gives my angel overtime because I'm always needing help. Um, but it was, Jesus said, that word that fell on stony ground, that means... That person had no depth. They received that word with joy. Oh, hallelujah. You know, that happens in revival or that happens in a good service and people come and, and, and oh, wonderful, awesome. But then when revival services are over or they miss church a time or two and then it's easier to miss the next time, then all of a sudden, they've wilted. Persecution comes. They become offended. They become offended because of the word. Because of the word. They have no depth. Jesus is calling us to a life deeply rooted in him. He's calling us to a relationship where we depend on him. Where he is our life. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus went away from there and came to his own country and hometown, which is Nazareth. And his disciples followed with him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who listened to him were utterly astonished, saying, Where did this man acquire all this? What is the wisdom, the broad and full intelligence which has been given to him? What mighty works and exhibitions of power are wrought by his hands? They were blown away by him, by his wisdom, by his ability to teach and reveal things to them. They were blown away by the mighty works of God, the miracles that were taking place. They were in awe of him. And just like that, just like that, Somebody said, wait a minute, isn't this the carpenter? The son of Mary and the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here among us? And they took offense at him and were hurt. That is, they disapproved of him. Catch this. And it hindered them from acknowledging his authority and they were caused to stumble and fall. They were Essentially offended at God. So often we forget how great God is. And we want to see him through the lens of our understanding. But he clearly tells us in his word. My ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's economy, God's kingdom operates in a much different way than the way we think. And the way we process things. And this gospel is not an Americanized thing. This gospel is for the whole world. 
We have tried to fit it in an American box and we've made a huge mistake because it's built walls. Jesus marveled. He was not able to do many mighty works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. What happened? They saw everything that he was doing and they were giving glory to God and talking between themselves and then all of a sudden they removed the identity that God had placed on him and said, wait just a minute. He's one of us. Who does he think he is? And isn't it amazing that Jesus could not do all the mighty works that he wanted to do because of their unbelief, because they were offended. And that thinking, the scripture is clear, it caused them to stumble. May I tell you that when we carry an offense toward God, whether we recognize it or we don't, if there is something that says, well, Lord, I love you, but you know I love you and I got this thing, and I, but he knows. And it's not that he doesn't love you. Oh, he loves you. Oh, how he loves us. And he calls for us to surrender everything to him, even our disappointments. I so appreciated the way Pastor Jason prayed this morning, just a few minutes ago. And he said, God, all of our hurts, all of our failures, everything, Lord, we want to surrender it to you. And that, my friends, is the key to not carrying an offense toward God. Just surrender and say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it, but I trust you. I know you are faithful. I know that you watch over your word to perform it. I know that, that you honor your word. You regard your word even above your name. You will do what you have promised but our hearts must be set on him and then aligned with his plans and purposes and not just our own. When our hearts are aligned with just what we want, that's when we get disappointed. That's when a door can open for offense. That's when there is a place for the enemy to dig in and create bitterness in our heart, oops, sorry, bitterness in our hearts. In Matthew chapter 15, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase this story. Um, Jesus had just had an encounter with scribes and Pharisees, and as you know, they were always offended with him. Because he was upsetting the apple cart. And he challenged them. They came to him and said, why is it that your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And they, they don't observe all the customs and all that. And Jesus just called them out. He said, listen, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Because you elevate the traditions of men above the word and commandment of God. Jesus wasn't afraid to call them out. Listen, folks. I know God is love and we want to love people, but we can't get so weak need and have no backbone that we can't stand flat footed and say, listen, I love you, but I will not compromise the truth. The word of God says, and you can be free and you don't, you know, and sometimes people are going to receive it. But Jesus said, all men are going to hate you for my name's sake. This is not a tiptoe through the tulips time in the body of Christ. There's, there is coming a line of demarcation. God said, I would that you be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm because if you are, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And it's time for the church to rise up and say, I will not be offended at God. I may not understand everything, but I choose to trust him. I choose to lay my life in his hands. I'm not my own. I belong to him and I will allow him to do whatever he wants to do. If I understand it, if I don't understand it, yet he is God and he is worthy of my praise. Can you praise him in this house? Hallelujah. So he has this encounter with the scribes and Pharisees. And, and he, he begins to tell them. He's talking to them. He says, listen, it's not what goes into a man. In other words, they're not washing hands, so what? It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. But it's what comes out of a man. And he begins to name all these sins of the flesh. 
He'd already called them hypocrites. They were not happy. And it's funny to me because then in verse 15, Peter said to him, explain this proverb to us. Good old Peter. After he got the Holy Ghost, he was brilliant. But before he got filled with the Spirit, he was a knucklehead. And Jesus said, are you also even yet dull and ignorant and without understanding and unable to put things together? Do you not see and understand that what goes into the mouth passes into the abdomen and so passes to the place where discharges are deposited? But whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And that's what makes a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, reasonings, disputings, murder, adultery, and so on and so forth. So they had this long discourse. They just had this conversation. Jesus called out those scribes and Pharisees. Then he had to explain it to the guys. And it says then that in verse 21, and going away from there, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And there was a woman there who was a Canaanite. She was a Syrophoenician woman. And she began to cry out diligently, have mercy on me. She said, O oh Lord, son of David. That's important. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord, son of David. You see, the Pharisees, they didn't recognize him as the son of David. But this Syrophoenician woman, she's a Gentile. And she's calling him. She recognizes who he is and knows the authority that he carries. And she's crying out, oh, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And he did not. She said, my daughter is miserably and cruelly possessed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came. And they said to him, send her away. Get her out of here. She's a Gentile and she's a woman and she's a nuisance. What is about to happen was not an attack on this woman. She became a teaching tool. When Jesus did answer, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she came and kneeling, worshipped him and kept praying, Lord, help me. Notice the posture. She knelt. She knew who he was. She acknowledged his authority. And then she knelt and worshiped him, pleading for help. Scribes and Pharisees didn't do that. Those knucklehead, knucklehead disciples wasn't getting it. But this woman knew who he was and called him out. And she knelt and worshiped him and said, please help me help my baby. And he answered, it's not right or becoming to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. He's talking about the Jews. This gospel was meant first to the Jews. He said, it's not right for me to take what belongs to the child seated at the table and give it to the dogs. She said, oh, but master, even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall under the master's table. To the ears of many, it sounded like Jesus called her a dog. I don't believe he was doing that. I think the disciples thought that either. <laughs> yeah, he's giving her what for? No, no. Because she became an illustration of what he wanted them to understand. She knows who I am and she is going to worship me and she is not going to be offended by anything I say to her. Why is that? Because she was too desperate to be offended. Too desperate. But how many people are walking around too offended to be desperate for God? Too offended. Don't want to take the, the preaching of the whole gospel. They only want that, that nice little cushy, fuzzy, feel-good Sunday morning, cry a few tears and go live life the way you always do through the week and come back and do it again the next time the doors are open. That's not going to cut it. 
because people are not being fed what they need. We can't just eat dessert all the time. We've got to have not just milk, but the meat of the Word of God. And Jesus said some hard things. Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was cured from that moment. He just illustrated. I have to wonder, maybe later he explained, guys, you remember the conversation I had with the Pharisees? Remember I explained to you, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out? What came out of this woman? What came out of her? She honored me by calling me son of David, Lord. She wasn't afraid to surrender herself to my authority and bow herself in worship and with a contrite heart and plead for my help. And she didn't even mind when I insinuated that as society said that she was just a dog because she was a Gentile. Even that did not deter her. She refused to be offended. And that is the heart God is looking for. That is the heart. And then lastly, I want to go to John chapter 6, and I'll be closing. And there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of scripture here that I would love to read, want to read, but I, I'm going to, going to try to go through this, and I, I hope that's okay. I'm, I'm a word person. Yeah, I can tell a story now and then, but I just love the word of God when we dig into it. The truth of God is what sets us free. It's the truth of God. When you hear people say, well, that's my truth. No, baby, that's not truth at all. There is no your truth and your truth and your truth. There is the truth, and his name is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus had fed 5,000 men and then probably women and children. And then the people started after, after they gathered up... Uh, 12 small baskets full of leftovers, the people started getting excited and saying, hey, man, we need to rally around this guy. This guy is a gravy train. We won't have to worry about where our food is coming from. He can multiply it. And Jesus recognizes that he's going to have to get out of there because these people, the word of God says, he, he perceived that they wanted to seize him and try to make him their king. So it said that he departed from there and he went up into the hills. Well, the disciples then got into a boat and they went, they went across, they started to go across the Sea of Galilee. And the word says that they had rowed three or four miles. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of rowing. And they hadn't made much, they were just fighting, fighting, and this tempest came up. And Jesus sees them, so he walks out. And at first they were afraid. And he said, don't worry, it's me. And then they were glad and he got in the boat. But notice, in that chapter, it says, oh, let me find it here. It says that when he got in the boat, immediately the boat met its destination. Immediately. They weren't making any progress, but when he got in the boat, the boat immediately went to its destination. Sometimes in my life, maybe you can relate. I have rowed and rowed and rowed my boat. And things come against me, and I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. When the truth was, I just needed Jesus to come and get in my boat. So often we lean on our own understanding, our own self, our own strength, our own intelligence to get things done or to try to achieve something or to make something happen. And we row and we row and we row and the wind comes and we're not getting to where we need to be and we just need Jesus to get in the boat. Because when he's in the boat, all of a sudden the journey is not a problem. All of a sudden you're where you need to be. Wow. Wow. And then, the next day, all these people, they come looking for Jesus. Crowds, crowds came. I mean, he fed 5,000 plus the day before. 
And all these people were coming. And he said to them, listen, you're not even coming to me for the mighty works. He said, you're coming because you were fed with the loaves and you were filled and satisfied. He said, stop toiling to produce for food that perishes and decomposes and strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures. And then he goes on and there's this whole discourse. He begins to challenge them. And he says twice, I am the bread of life. And that really aggravated them because they said, wait a minute. Our father fed us manna from heaven. We've had manna. You can't be the bread of life. Jesus said, yes, they ate manna and they're all dead. I am the bread of life. And then he goes on to say, if you will eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will never die. He begins to tell them what life is. And it's, he talks about being vitally united. He said, he who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood dwells continually in me. And I, in like manner, dwell continually in him. Just as the Father sent me and I live by and through and because of the Father, even so, whoever continues to feed on me, whoever takes me for his food and nourishment, shall live through and because of me. And it says in verse 59 that he said these things in a synagogue when he was teaching in Capernaum. But this just blows my mind. Verse 60. When his disciples heard this, many of them said, this is a hard and difficult and strange saying. An offensive and unbearable message. Who can stand to hear it? Who can be expected to listen to such teaching? His disciples. And it wasn't just the 12. There were people at that point in time that followed him and counted themselves as, as a, a, a greater, a, another circle of disciples. And wherever he was, that's where they wanted to be. And then there were the multitudes who came. But the Jews that heard him talk about this, the Bible says the Jews became angry. But then the disciples said, wait a minute. This is hard. When you talk to a Jew about eating flesh and drinking blood, that's like an abomination. They, they had strict rules about handling dead bodies. And, you know, if someone passed away, they buried them by sundown. You just didn't do that. But Jesus, knowing within himself that his disciples were complaining and protesting and grumbling about it, said to them, is this a stumbling block and an offense to you? Does this upset and displease and shock and scandalize you? What then will be your reaction if you should see the Son of Man ascending to the place where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh conveys no benefit whatever. The words that I've been speaking to you, they are spirit and they are life. But still some of you fail to believe and trust and have faith. For Jesus knew from the first who did not believe and had no faith and who would betray him and be false to him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples drew back and returned to their old associations and no longer accompanied him. All of a sudden, this outer group of disciples, they started scattering. They couldn't handle what Jesus was saying. They couldn't get their human thinking 
and the tradition that had been poured into them. They couldn't get it out of their mind enough to hear the truth and the living word that was being spoken to them. And then Jesus said to the 12, and this is heartbreaking. Jesus said to the 12, will you leave me too? Will you also go away? Do you desire to leave me? And Peter, he finally says something beneficial. He says, it says, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that is my question, not just for this house, but... Oh, if if only the whole body of Christ could get this message that we are not in an hour where we can just tiptoe through the tulips. We are in an hour. It is. You say, oh, when the end times come, baby, we are in them. I don't know how long it's going to take for everything to play out, but if you watch the news and you compare it to your Bible, uh, if, if, if you get on mailing lists for news agencies out of Israel, which I do, let me tell you, there's more going on than the American media ever tells us involving Israel. God is putting this thing together. And we're not going to go back to normal. Jesus is coming back. We can't go back to normal because normal Christianity has gotten soft. We've become entitled. And if God doesn't do it when we want him to do it, the way we want to do it, with whom or what we want him to do it, then we get our little feelings hurt. God, I don't know why you did that. Listen, if you have an attitude, that's different than saying, Father, I don't understand. When the angel came to Mary and he told her she was going to have a baby, Mary said, how shall these things be? When the same angel went to Zechariah, the church guy, and said, hey, you're going to have a son. His attitude was entirely different, but he asked the same question. How can this be? Same question. But it was the heart out of which he asked the question that caused God to close his mouth so that the blessing of God and the plan of God could not be canceled. Jesus is calling us to be inoffensible. The Apostle Paul understood that. In Acts chapter 24, he was before uh, Felix, the governor, And he was trying to convince him of the gospel. And he made a statement. He said, I work to keep my heart in such a place that I don't carry offense against God or man. This is Paul. This is Paul. And Paul worked at keeping his heart clear of offense toward God and offense toward man. Now, I want to pour some healing oil into this message. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and the Holy Spirit has caused this word to get your attention. And it is the word. It's not the vessel. It's the word. Maybe you can think of a disappointment that you've never really dealt with. You tried to cover it over. You've tried to put it aside. But that disappointment, because you've never dealt with it. Number one, it stands as an opportunity for the enemy to sap you of your power with God. And number two, it keeps you from having that free-flowing, open relationship with the Holy Spirit of God that comes with an open heart and a surrendered life. Sis, would you come? So this morning, I want to ask you to stand. I want to thank you for for your patience and your reception of the Word of God this morning. I don't take lightly the opportunity of sharing the Word, no matter where I am. But this Word 
I've been chewing on this. It started out as bones about a year ago. And over, over this past year, the Lord has step by step put more meat on it for me. And there are things that I've had to say, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't even really realize that I was mad at you. You know what? He knows that. He knows that. But he's so good. Have you ever had your kids when they were little, you correct them? And they don't like the correction and they get mad. And some of those little toddlers can get downright mean in the things they say. And the little four and five-year-olds get mean in what they